well, thanks very much for that, uh, that the, the kind introduction and for the invitation to, uh, to to come and talk about the project that me and a number of colleagues were doing over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so the project's called Active Online Reading, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to it um, and then talk you through some of the things that we found out in the process of doing it. So can we go to the next slide? There are a few slides, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through them, I think, quite quickly. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing the project. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about, well, I'm going to talk in some depth about some of our key findings, some of the main things that we discovered through doing the project. Um, reflect a bit on pedagogy, uh, and I've, I haven't been able to come to all of the sessions so far, but I um, enjoyed the bit of Angela's talk that I saw thinking about how we actually, what are the specific online pedagogies we can deploy to teach people to read more effectively. I'll point towards some of the resources that we created as a, as a result of the project, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the things we're planning to do in future. Uh, so can we move on to the next slide? So the project was funded by the QAA and actually um, by TALIS. So they they shared the funding for this project. So I um, wanted to thank TALIS as well as the QAA for their support. Um, it ran for, for a year, for 2021 to 22. And really it built on some work that I and other colleagues have been doing. Um, we all happen to be historians. So there were three of us, one at John Chandler at UCL, uh, another Anna Richabad at Nottingham and myself. We we're all historians and we were all making making uh, use of Talis Elevate. So it again, links a little bit back to what Angela was talking about. And through that, we'd sort of, we felt like we developed a bit of a community of practice in um, thinking about how you teach people to read online in history specifically. So we applied for the funding to try and broaden out that from uh, sort of his, the, the narrower focus on history to thinking about other disciplines. So uh, in the course of the project, we worked particularly closely with uh, colleagues in the School of Design at Sheffield Hallam and in the Business School at the University of Salford. Um, and the project was really underpinned, I mean it was a requirement really from the QAA, but it was a happy requirement because it was underpinned by this kind of working in partnership with students approach. So students were conducting a lot of the, um, the you know, the primary work on the project uh, and we were acting a, a little bit more as supervisors really. We Next slide please. So what we did in the course of the project, we ran a bunch of workshops, we got involved in events that were being run by TALIS and the QAA um, and, and other external organi organizations external to that. Um, we conducted literature reviews, we tried to gather case studies and generated some pedagogic resources, which I'll show you towards the end. All of these can be accessed on the project website. So I think if you just search for active online reading, you should hopefully find the project. If not, there's a link at the end of the of the talk. Um, I think the two main things that we did though in terms of kind of uh, generating new knowledge was the first thing was we got our student researchers to write a series of um, reflective blogs in which they talked about their own um, practices of reading online and their thoughts on how they'd been teach to, taught to read online. Um, and that kind of gave us this rich qualitative data um, and, and really helped us to see how, how students experience some of these things rather than it being driven so much from a, a staff perspective. So those blogs are really interesting if you have time to read some of them. And then we ran a survey of staff and students, um, which was open to, a, well, it was an in, in, open internationally. Anyone who wanted to could fill it in. And we tried to use our various networks to kind of generate uh, a good number of responses that would allow us to to um, sort of develop our insights. So next slide, please. So the survey was op were opened roughly this time last year and it stayed open into the new year. Um, we got a lot of responses. So um, actually nearly 700 student responses and over 100 from staff. What we did with those was was kind of narrow them down to those that we, we felt were most were usable really people who'd answered most of or the entire survey for instance rather than people who'd started it and kind of dropped out very quickly or who hadn't really started it at all um so we got from that we had nearly 450 student responses and 100 staff responses from 10 countries and over 50 institutions so it's a random sample but it's quite quite a a, a substantial uh, sample we think um and it's a humanities focused 
focus group as well. I think that's one of the things I would emphasize. Most of our respondents were in the kind of humanities and then the social sciences with a smattering from other disciplines. Um, we asked students who responded to the survey whether they, we asked them a disability related question. We asked them if they had a disability that they had either been diagnosed with or that they felt they felt themselves by an undiagnosed disability that affected their ability to engage in reading. So we got about 15% of those of our respondents belong to that category, which we'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about a bit more as we move through the, the slides. So next slide. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what our findings reveal about the experiences of, of students in particular. One of the key things we found we identified was a real disjunction between probably not that surprising um, between staff and student perspectives on these um, on the issue of online reading. When we asked staff, you know, what do you think about students skills in or ability to to engage in online reading? We got a kind of quite a not a particularly positive response. You'll see from the 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 bar, uh, the pie chart on the left that most people were kind of in the neutral to negative perception of students kind of ability in online reading. Whereas when we asked the students and the right hand pie chart, we're getting a skew towards a more positive appraisal of their reading. So a real disjunction there. Staff don't think students are particularly good um, within our sample. And students think that they are pretty good at reading online. Um, and within this, we kind of asked some some sort of uh, qualitative follow up questions and um, we got uh, some really interesting responses, one of which I've put on there, this idea that, um, you know, staff are kind of cajoling students into reading online, but there's a feeling from from some that this sort of a non instrumental approach to reading isn't particularly present. There's this lack of curiosity. If it's not linked to the assessment, students are less interested in it. Um, so that was one of the kind of themes that we saw from from staff respondents. Uh, next slide, please. When we broke this down a bit, um, we see that there isn't much difference between first year confidence and other other students. So within the this was a kind of sample across different student cohorts and uh, and year groups, and we see that first years are kind of in line with the overall average they're certainly in line with the overall average of people who um, didn't say that they had a disability that affected their their reading um, so there's a kind of alignment between first years and the general cohort whereas one might expect perhaps first years being a little bit less confident so one of the things I'm going to talk about later is the need for for some work on in terms of transition I think an interesting, when we broke it down by disability, though, those who had said that they had some kind of disability that, were, that affected their, their reading, they were less confident, un, unsurprisingly. So, so that I mean, that's not surprising, but it does demonstrate that they sit kind of a bit behind the average in terms of their confidence. Next slide. We asked students also about um, how much time they spent reading. Um, and we tried to ask, ask them, we asked them about the total amount of reading they did in preparation for class. And we're, you know, given that it's a humanities heavy sample and maybe we were sort of ex perhaps expecting more students to be doing more than five hours reading a week for their, all of their classes. So this was quite, quite surprising um, to us. When I've talked about this at other presentations, um, it hasn't proved as surprising to many members of the audience. So perhaps I'm, I'm a bit, um, I have too high expectations and I need to sort of um, adjust them. Um, we also asked, asked some follow-up questions around what students, um, you know, basically to, to get at what, how they read, what they think reading is in this context. And very much it's connected to the idea of reading equals note taking. Um, some other interesting findings were that students frequently use, they're using technology to access text, whether or not the reading takes place online or offline. So quite a lot of them, talk, including our, our student researchers, talk about, well, I need to find the reading by you know going through the relevant database or whatever, but then I print it off and use it offline, engage with it offline. So there's this kind of, some kind of relationship going on between online and offline reading. So many students 
also talk about preferring that hard copy experience and struggling with things like eye strain. Uh, perhaps the, you know, one of the biggest themes within the student responses, and this is also reflected amongst our researchers, was the, the physicality of reading online or reading digital texts. Repeated mention of things, not just eye strain, but backache, headache, all of these things as being the result of being expected to read on screen a lot. Uh, and many mention that reading something they do kind of, you know, sort of for convenience, that they read a lot while traveling or while doing other things, which I think is noteworthy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, when we asked about amount you read, unsurprisingly, the first years read less than. So, so we do see an increase as students go through their, their studies. The first years read less than the second and third and fourth years who read less than the, the postgraduates in total who read less than the postgraduate researchers. So we do seem to see a progression in the amount of reading that students are reporting that they do over their degrees, which I think is what we would expect, but it's also good, I think. Next slide. More interesting or more, more like I think worthy of digging into and discussion is this when we broke it down by disability. Again, I don't think it's surprising, but it's stark, I think, to see it laid out. Students who reported that they have a disability that affects their reading um, read less than students who don't. I don't think that's surprising, but given that we presumably need to be, you know, how do we help them to engage in reading? more how do we address that that sort of gap because the implication is perhaps that means that they fall behind more if they're engaging less in reading and they struggle with it so i think that's something that's worthy of uh, of not, again not surprising but worthy of consideration next slide please uh we also asked students um towards the end a kind of more I guess like a more fun reflective question um what would you change if there's one thing you could change in relation to your reading what would it be and a lot of them talked about you know their specific skills they'd like to develop their practices around reading things around collaboration were, were mentioned frequently so that um I think that obviously links to things like elevate um but the the, the main answer the, the the most prevalent one was that dedicating more time to reading so there is something to be uh, dug into and discussed around how to simply develop the habit and the ability to engage in more reading how do we encourage students to do that that earlier and to develop those that progression in the, their reading um as they go through the degree next slide uh, so next bit, I'm going to talk a bit about what we what we figured out about people's pedagogies. So can we move on from that? So there's another disjunction to report here. And remember, this isn't the sample of um, maybe some of the people in this in this meeting did fill in our survey, but this is a, a broader sample. This is the people who are willing to fill in the survey. So I think it's more general than a, the people in this digital room who are presumably interested in digital reading. So we asked staff, how important is online reading to students learning in your discipline? And I think the overwhelming response there is that it's very important. Um, so vast majority of people giving it a rating of 10. Can we move on to the next slide? But we then asked, um, how much time do you, how much attention do you devote to your, in your own modules to developing students' ability to read online? Um, so quarter, no, not a quarter, a fifth of people see it as a kind of embedded activity. Uh, two, two fifths um, talk about it as having some level of activity in their module, but another two fifths basically say, I don't really do anything about it at all, or I do nothing about it. So there's a kind of disjunction there, at least at the level of the individual module, maybe not at the level of the program, between the, the importance that people ascribe to online reading and the attention that they give to it in their modules which I think is another interesting uh, disjunction that we, we need, we're interested in addressing. Next slide. Within those people who have, were at attaching some uh, importance to this, we asked them how, what sort of pedagogy, what, what's the kind of, a, we were trying to get at pedagogy. How do you get students to engage in reading, whether it's online or offline? Um, the vast majority of responses talk about the text, which again, is a humanities response, unsurprising really, this focus on the text. The, importance is, the important thing is about the selection of appropriate reading 
by the tutor. Um, that's the key thing. It's the nature of the reading itself um, that's important. Um, sometimes some, some re reference to kind of how that might be scaffolded to support engagement. Next, you've got the kind of um, like what, what pedagogies did people lay out as being important for doing this? So we various um, uh, references to specific teaching methods, you know, guiding questions, worksheets, um, those sorts of things, specific kind of in-class activities like workshops or, um, you know, the, the sorts of, you know, the in-class pedagogy that, that, that people talk about. But that wasn't a great focus. Really, the text was the most the biggest focus. The other interesting thing I think is like a real focus on the person of the teacher of the teacher themselves or the lecturer themselves as the person who's driving this. So the emphasis being through verbally verbal emphasis or in writing the, the value and necessity of reading to achieve success. So very much focused on the teacher. And so so the focus here really in the text and the and the teacher is on what we what we provide for the students and i think overall within the sample less of a focus on the pedagogy really next slide um i also can't re oh, i was looking through these slides just before i start we, we, i came online and i can't remember what this was about i think um what it was meant to illustrate um was a that the pedagogy, when people did talk about pedagogy, it was it was very much. Um, I think they they spoke about sort of offline how how you teach students to read in sort of you would have taught them to read traditionally in kind of analog ways in with offline reading, and then there wasn't a great deal of focus, particularly on sort of online methods for teaching people to read specifically online or digital types of texts. So. Again, I think there's something interesting to it to pick pick up on and pick pick up uh, pick through there. Next slide. Um, some students, I'm, I'm pretty certain that many most degrees that I have familiar familiarity with do have some level of kind of intro, introduction to critical thinking, introduction to how to read texts in your specific discipline. Some students, though, ex, you know, basically said, "Well, this didn't exist in my degree." Um, so next slide. When we asked students about, would look at this graph to begin with. Um, when we asked students, where where is it in your degree? That their responses reflected that what I just talked about. I didn't. It wasn't offered to me. It was something that I had to actually find out for myself. I didn't attend the training, even if it was offered, or it was you know it was something like it was an induction. It was very early on. Um, and then those, those kind of lesser ones about whether it was assessed, whether it was compulsory, they're getting much fewer responses than than this idea that it's basically very optional, it's very early, or it's not there at all. So I think there's something around when when these interventions happen, or if they happen at all. Um, and if the if the assumption of staff is, well, I don't cover it in my module, but it's covered somewhere else, that's clearly not the the experience of students or the, the students who responded to our survey. So there's something about accessibility. Students and staff rated accessibility as perhaps the key benefit of online reading for a number of reasons, a perception that it's kind of, it, there's, there's a cost benefit to it, um, a perception that it's more flexible than, than other, you know, reading hard copy and linked to that, the ease of access and use was referred to frequently. It, it's kind of, it, it's easier to sort of access and get, get hold of. Um, and for reading, this also extended to the selection of materials in terms of things like length, difficulty level, appropriateness, and that links back to something that Angela said about giving students different options of things to read at different kind of levels, I think. Um, but within that, there are questions around when, when this takes place, so it's timing and also it's placement within the overall curriculum, I think, as opposed to the level of individual modules. Next slide. Right. Um, we we're also, you know, the project was partially funded by Talis. We we're very interested in finding about, about collaborative reading, partly based on our own experiences of using Elevate. So we asked students about sharing and being able to, to see see what other people had had written online, sharing what you think about your online reading and other people uh, sharing what they 
they um, they thought about it. And we we see something quite interesting. Students are very think it's very positive to be able to see what other people have written about their reading, but they're slightly less keen to share what they they think about it, um, which I think is entirely to be to, to sort of predictable, really. Um, but they do talk, if we can move on to the next slide, they talk about this collaborative reading as being a really significant aid to their understanding, this discussion of whatever sort, being able to see what other people have written improves confidence and it helps them to feel, this is a quote from one of them, validated and verified by their peers in some cases. So that sort of like peer interaction, or even just being able to see what other people have written can help students to feel a bit more confident. Um, that being able to see what other people have written and that they don't necessarily think the same thing as you helps them to, to reflect and evaluate their own opinions, um, helps them to develop skills in terms of um, yeah, the, their skills around reading. And, and they also talk to some degree about it having some social benefit um, that it, it's not the same as being in class, but it, it does enable you to create some kind of connection to your, your classmates. So students don't, they, they can see a benefit in sharing their own ideas, but the, the greater benefit is being able to see what other people have written. Um, so so that again, I think there's some work to be done to really encourage that sharing side of things to see the benefit in that too, the benefit of articulating your own thoughts um, in, in, in kind of dialogue with other people. Next slide. So I'm just gonna point you to some of the resources we've produced before I conclude. Next slide. Um, with the brilliant support of um, Talis, um, we we produced these kind of um, kind of infographics. It's probably a bit too much text on there to actually call them infographics. They kind of got like little uh, one-page guidance documents. Most most three of which are um, student-facing that are about helping students to think about reading collaboratively. Um, think about how they might learn from what other students have done, how to focus when they're reading online. Um, and then there's one that's focused on institutions, what do institutions need to do to, to support this kind of online reading. Um, if you scan that QR card, it should take you to a file that has all of those in it, or you can go to our website and download them individually. We, we really encourage people to, to, to get involved. Next slide. Um, We've also been sharing what we found. So there's tons of stuff on the blog around, there's blog posts, case studies, various um, slides from conferences, and in some cases, recordings from conferences that you can go and look at um, uh, various presentations I've done and, and my colleagues have done. And we've been slowly trying to publish the results of some of this research in, in sort, of, um, sort of kind of case study, reflective case study um, publications. So. Again, you can go and follow that up via the website if you're interested in learning a little bit more. I think we've got a concluding slide. Um, so just to conclude, because um, I want to leave time for questions, reading uh, reading is obviously related to tons of other skills like digital literacy, uh, information literacy, digital literacy, writing in particular, and online reading obviously feeds into that. So there's something we need to think about relationships between all these different skills in online and offline contexts. Students talk repeatedly and staff, in fact, around distraction, digital distraction being a real challenge to online reading. Students talk repeatedly about the physical challenges of it, that it's difficult physically, which wasn't something I'd thought about before I started the project. I think there's something to be done with staff around managing expectations and uh, meeting students where they actually are rather than where we wished they were. I think that's a real challenge um, for, for um, uh, there's something to be done in relation to the curriculum and thinking about how we manage the transition to university study in relation to reading and online reading, and then how we structure and, and embed progression through the curriculum. There's clearly a lot of potential from the research we've done and the other work that I've done in the past on, on sort of around Elevate, the potential for collaborative reading and annotation is great, I think. Um, more, more in terms of next steps, I think we're really keen to start to break this down in terms of disciplinary skills. So what are this, what can we see in terms of specific disciplines as opposed to online reading generally? So me and a couple of our student researchers have published a, sh a short blog post on the QAA blog, which is thinking about this in relationship to classics. Um, 
so we, we want to continue that work um, in, in kind of disciplinary specific contexts. And I think it's also, we want to think more about what are the online specific pedagogies for teaching online reading or what are specific pedagogies for teaching online reading? I'm not sure the right formulation. How do we refine those as opposed to more general approaches to reading? Um, I think that's it. There's one more slide, but that's just says thank you for listening, I think. Yeah, if you want to follow up, there's there's some uh, things you can follow up with, and I'm happy to answer questions now or via email. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was absolutely fantastic. We've already had some engagement in the chat um, from Angela, actually, um, from just uh, who was talking just before you. Um, she's found that in her own practice, that staff often assume that students were doing much less reading than they actually were. Um, and questions whether they're judging by outcome, I think. And um, she also says that it's great to see that students want to spend more time reading, which um, I absolutely think, you know, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I wonder if anyone has any other questions that they would like to, to, to pop in the chat. We've had a few comments here just saying thanking you for that, um, for that great presentation. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll put the website link for Making Digital History into the, um, into the chat as well. Anyone have any questions for, for Jamie? Oh, we have a hand up. Can't see whose hand is up. Oh, Angela. <laughs> Okay, doke. Yep, I'll allow Angela to talk. Should be able to talk now, Angela. Oh yeah, hi. Oh, not Angela again. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think I put in the chat. You know, that chimes with generally about academic reading and the things that I'm interested in. Uh, but also, in particular, I think um, the thing about disciplinary differences is very interesting, isn't it? And, and, and it links to transitions, I think, there. And I was thinking about the hours reading and who the students were and, and your attention to the fact that this was from a humanities section of people. Mm. And um, I think it goes back to that idea of what does scholarship mean? And if you're coming into university, you're engaging in scholarship and what does that mean in different disciplines? And you know, lots of the chemistry students will be in labs and they're so busy and they're taught nine till four, five days or four and a half days a week, aren't they? And often in the humanities and social sciences, that's that mystery of reading, whether it's online or off, isn't it? That that is actually the scholarship. Yeah. And how do we expose that to students is really interesting. So I found that very interesting. And also about what academics, how they sense what their role is in this. Yeah. Um, and I think there's lots of opportunities to explore that. And um, it's one of the key, um, it is a key to opening up success for students, but it's also one that's very hidden and we don't always even know where the lock is to put the key in it. <laughs> so it's really great to see all that. And as I say, it does chime with a lot of my um, experiences and research but also it's really interesting and, I, and I'm with you on that I think one of the key things is about disciplinary disciplinary knowing yeah. and that 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 the fact that it is different and the ways of reading are different so I just wanted to say thanks thank you yeah I mean I think just to I mean I think the um in a way what we did we did a project we we the survey sort of justified the need for the project in the first place because we identified all these kind of disjunctions, the places where sort of staff and students are not quite meeting. Um, so it was, yeah, and, and, and one of those things was that issue. I th we thought transition would be something that came up, but it clearly clearly is really important. And in a way, it's within the humanities, what the, the challenge of that the students face is what to do with all that independence. In a way, it's a challenge of things just very time management and like how do you yeah. manage your priorities and things like that is because what we're you know we, we're wanting them to and in a way that they don't get as many contact hours and probably as they go through the degree they're stripped away even more because we're expecting more in independent work of them in the library or on you know on, or the digital library or whatever um so but but sort of like scaffolding that expectation mm. particularly early on i think is is the real is the real challenge um, and and then there's those 
how do you develop you know the ability to read the this sort of ability to read for different purposes in different contexts yeah, yeah. i think is one of the th so like that you might want to read you know sk skim reading isn't a skill we want to you know get rid of but w what are the other types of skills that we need to be developing in relation to reading to refine that and then yeah. for something like um for something like classics it's how, how do you make a how do you make, get students to like be able to read in really deep ways about mm. you know potentially very actually very small bits of text how do you get them to dig into them rather than trying to get through lots of text very quickly um yeah so there's a there's, there's a lot to be done i think on that disciplinary um disciplinary front i think um, um one of my colleagues a law lecturer inspired by the reading retreats like i'm gonna read i'm gonna read in tutorials so she had spent time actually reading with the students equally yeah. none of them had read it before sitting and reading and then thinking and then sharing actually modeling reading and making it public but i think that um the one thing i've discussed with somebody else with talis elevate the annotations is the potential for academics to expose their reading of texts through that yeah and then to invite students to look at the way they are thinking and noting and reflecting on the on a text and then to add to it and so there's there's a lot of potential there isn't there to collaborate in reading in terms of modeling what what they think reading is or or the processes thinking processes that you go through when you read something deeply what do we mean by that so i think there's lots of potential to use it to do those things yeah i think modeling readings i mean in a way that, that you know that modeling of reading it's re, it's reflecting on a higher education level like how yeah. people are taught to read right to begin with like you read along you sort of follow along with somebody reading you have mm -hmm. them you know pointing out words yeah. in the text sometimes with actually with their fingers it's like a very you know fundamental approach yeah yeah um and and I, I think i hadn't really thought about that as something that we could we could do with an elevate um mm -hmm. I, I guess we've seen with that collaborative element you see sort of students modeling it for each other on some kind of level but yeah. it's not yeah that's that's really interesting thank you let's do it <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for that. That was a that was a fantastic um, exchange there as well. We have had some uh, wonderful questions in the um, the chat as well. I'm afraid um, we'll we'll have to move on um, to our, our next speaker, um, so we won't have time to get to those. But um, uh, Jamie, you did mention earlier on that you're happy to be um, emailed with any questions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for those questions, um, and I'm sure Jamie can can answer those uh, elsewhere as well. 